All right. Good morning and uh, good afternoon if you're logging in from a different time zone. Uh, the purpose of this engagement uh, today is to have a conversation with the uh, former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, uh, Jim Miller, uh, and it's a conversation about the Middle East and U.S. policy uh, toward the region. Uh, I'll moderate this conversation and I'll, I'll do that with uh, great pleasure uh, having known Jim for some time and uh, having worked with him in the past. Uh, my name is Bilal Saab. I run the uh, Defense and uh, Security Program at the Middle East Institute. Uh, this is the fourth episode of the uh, Defense uh, Leadership Series, which is a high-level speakers uh, forum uh, that we created in June of this year, and it was uh, inaugurated by uh, current CENTCOM uh, Commander uh, General Frank McKinsey. Uh, Jim, we're so grateful uh, for your uh, willingness to do this with us, especially at a very busy time for you and uh, at a time of still anxiety uh, in uh, our country and around the world. I can tell you that uh, a large number of people have registered uh, to uh, listen to you. So there's a lot of interest in what you have to say. So once again, thank you and welcome to um, MEI's Defense Leadership Series in this uh, fourth episode. Uh, I could spend a long no, thank time. thank you. You're most welcome. I, I could spend a long time introducing you, uh, Jim, and highlighting uh, your many accomplishments throughout your uh, impressive career. But let me just say briefly, uh, that uh, Jim served as uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, as I said, from May of 2012 to January of 2014 in the Obama administration. Um, and he has received various awards uh, for his exceptional service. Um, so thank you for your service, uh, Jim. Uh, he's the president uh, of Adaptive Strategies, which is a consulting firm um, on strategy management and uh, various uh, technology issues. Uh, Jim has a BA from Stanford, uh, an MA and PhD from Harvard. I've heard of those schools. Um, uh, but let, let's just do this, Jim. Uh, tell us if there's anything you want to say about yourself that people may not know. I know that you are an exceptionally good tennis player. Is there anything else you want people to know about you? <laughs> well, we still have to get our tennis match in for sure. I'm looking forward to that. Um, no, I, I, I could tell you that I, I grew up in the Midwest. I had the opportunity to go to a couple of great universities and feel very fortunate to, to really have in very tangible ways live the American dream, including having the ability to contribute to our government at multi, in, in, you know, for a number of years in multiple roles. And where in the Midwest? Uh, Waterloo, Iowa. Got it, okay. Okay, uh, my colleagues tell me we have a hard stop at 10, so uh, at 11, uh, so why don't we just uh, get right into it? Um, we're we're gonna cover a bunch of policy items related to the Middle East, as I said, and uh, and I'm looking forward to that, Jim. But uh, before I do, let me address a couple of issues that you personally have commented on just recently and um, that uh, affect our national security. So on, on June 2nd, you wrote a letter uh, to Secretary Esper uh, published by the Washington Post uh, announcing your resignation from the Pentagon's Defense Science Board. So for audience members who may not know what the Defense Science Board is, what it does, or who may not have a chance and had a chance to read the letter. Tell us what were the reasons that you had in mind for that and tell us what the board does uh, and what are its functions. Okay, sure, Bilal. The Defense Science Board provides advice to the Secretary of Defense and to the department more broadly on issues related to science and technology. Those issues range from cybersecurity to outer space to nuclear weapons to new approaches to training and education. Uh, its reports are publicly available. So although uh, I'm not a member, I can say anymore, I can say you can Google Defense Science Board and, and see its reports or sometimes classified aspects, but the unclassified reports are online and it's a substantial compilation. I've been a member of the defense or I had been a member of the Defense Science Board for about six years since just after leaving services under secretary in January of 2014. And members are special government employees. They are unpaid, but they put in a lot of effort on various Defense Science Board task forces. And because they are special government employees, they swear an oath of office. The same oath of office I swore to be under secretary, principal deputy under secretary and in other positions. And so I quit. I quit when I saw Secretary Esper walk across the carnage of Lafayette Square with President Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 after protesters who were using their you know, First Amendment rights of assembly and of free speech 
uh, were tear gassed and, and shot with rubber bullets. And it was an easy decision to resign. And, and as I said in my letter to Secretary Esper, I believe that he had not lived up to his oath because he didn't make an effort to stop President Trump from doing so, or if he wasn't able or willing to do that, at least not participate in the violation of, of constitutional rights of Americans. And so that was an easy decision for me to resign. It was a hard decision to do it publicly. I've never resigned before like that. I've certainly doing it publicly was a, was a hurdle, but I decided that I really wanted to send a strong message. I wanted others in the Defense Department and in government to hear that message and to just reflect on what it means in their oath of office to say uh, that, they will, uh, that they will protect the constitution, uh, you know, support and defend the constitution of the United States, including in this case, first amendment rights, but other rights as well. And I just wanna conclude if I can, Bill, by saying I have been impressed by uh, Secretary Esper's actions after this event. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if my letter had any impact on him, mm -hmm. but I have been impressed. He's, he's stood up and been clear about the appropriate role of the military uh, uh, and that he doesn't want active duty troops engaged in police actions and that, he, uh, and that he certainly doesn't want them engaged in any inappropriate behavior. Yeah. And similarly for Chairman of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, who you probably saw in a, in a talk to the National Defense University that was public, apologize for uh, being part of that uh, photo opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of them both and I wish them and others well. And again, if my letter had any impact, I'm, I, although I love being a part of the, the, the Defense Science Board, it was a very small price to, price to pay. Let's stay on the subject of um, uh, leadership uh, for a moment. And um, let me ask you this. Do you, do you think we have a crisis? And this is a question that I asked uh, Michelle Flournoy on this platform uh, several weeks ago. Do you think we have a crisis of national security leadership right now? Or is it just a question of significant policy disagreements? Well, we have a crisis of national security leadership and it starts with the commander in chief. chief. It starts with President Trump. If you just look at today's top headlines, Russia has put bounties on US soldiers uh, and killing US soldiers in Afghanistan. Despite his claims to the contrary, there's no doubt that President Trump has known about that for months and he's done nothing. And, and more than that, he's invited President Putin to rejoin now the G7 to make it a G8 again. He's proposed, he's met with Trump, I'm sorry, Trump has met with Putin multiple times Taking care of Americans in harm's way is job number one for the president. And he has failed and he has been unwilling to acknowledge that. A second issue, obvious, uh, you know, we're doing this <laughs> over Zoom because of this issue, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Yep. I believe President Trump has utterly failed to lead a coherent national response mm -hmm. on that. And we literally have one of the least effective responses in the world. And again, taking care of Americans' health and safety is job number one of the president of the United States. And because the president has been unwilling or unable to lead, uh, starting from the failure to use the Defense Production Act early to his, to his failure to, set, to, to, to be a leader and acknowledge that this is a, a national crisis, uh, he has failed to lead. And I've gotta say, and I'm sorry to say, because I started my career uh, working for the Congress on the House Armed Services Committee staff in the late 1980s, it's been a failure of the Congress as well. Uh, and uh, Congress has failed to hold Trump to account uh, or to take actions to limit his, his, his negative uh, 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 actions uh, and consequences. And I, 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 so let me acknowledge, I'm, I am a registered Democrat. People may think this is partisan. I believe and I hope that I would be saying this if this were a democratic president acting in this way as well. And, and I commit that I would, I would do so. I understand that the members of Congress are concerned about political consequences if they cross Trump. Yeah. Uh, and those who have, uh, have paid a price. But uh, let me just sort of make something a little topical, um, even more topical. The, for those who haven't seen the play Hamilton on Broadway, it is being live streamed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton, one of our, you know, obviously one of our founding fathers, Hamilton wrote 51 of the 85 Federalist Papers. 
yeah. number 51 was is one of the most famous it's about the separation of powers mm -hmm. uh, and this was something although hamilton was an advocate of a strong executive a strong president he also was a, was very firm on the need for a balance of powers and for each branch in particular the congress to to keep the literally keep the president in line and hold him accountable right and i'll just i'll just conclude by saying that the the founding fathers uh, and and I recognize that's a, a gendered term. Uh, it, it wouldn't be used today, but the founders of the nation uh, uh, were particularly concerned about foreign influence on the president and on national leaders and Federalist Papers two through five. So the first one was an intro, two through five were about the concerns about foreign influence Mm -hmm. on the president and others and how that is such a, a very important challenge. And uh, Congress has failed to step up on, on that issue, not just re with respect to Russian influence on the 2016 elections, uh, but uh, the president, in my view, has violated the emoluments clause of the constitution uh, by not divesting uh, uh, from his international interests so that he is, he is personally making money off of U.S. foreign policy, and that is that is that is wrong, and it's Congress that should be holding him to account for that, and and should be preventing that. Um, one more question about the uh, domestic home front, and the reason why I ask about you know our posture internally is because, as you very well know, foreign policy starts at home. So I really am less interested. Uh, it's not really part of my specialty or portfolio to discuss internal domestic policy, right? But but I have to recognize, just like any other researcher, that, that everything starts at home. And so how we're postured internally certainly affects our dealings with uh, partners and allies and adversaries. So let me ask you one final one. There's been an exodus over the past couple of years, uh, which has accelerated over the past few years, of senior um, DOD officials um, just leaving uh, the Pentagon. And so uh, the latest being Katie Wheelbarger, uh, the uh, acting uh, assistant secretary of defense for international security. Uh, I think it's effective in a couple of days from now, um, her departure. I think it's effective tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. There you go. I believe July 3rd, yeah. So how concerned are you about this? Uh, or once again, just to try to play devil's advocate, this is primarily partisanship or political differences, or there's just much more to it than that? Every administration loses senior officials late in its first term or second term. Mm. What's different about this administration is, is two things. First of all, it has pushed some of those out who took principled stands and who did, in my view, uphold their oath of office. John Root, who was undersecretary of defense for policy, raised concerns about what was going on uh, with respect to withholding of aid to Ukraine uh, and as part of the process, as as one should, right? Internally, part of the process didn't go to the press. Right. Uh, and by all by all reports, by all press reports, certainly he was then asked to resign because he had done so. Uh, and you've got to, people need to be able to speak truth to power. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, if, if they therefore are dismissed, that's, that's the price they need to, that's the price they need to be willing to pay but leadership should send the opposite message. They should be listening to different voices then make the decision. But the other thing that's different about this administration is that it's failed to fill so many Senate confirmed positions in the first place. Right. In my old office, in Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, there are seven Senate confirmed positions. Five of these right now have people, including Katie, serving in an acting role. In other that's words, right. not Senate confirmed. That's right. Uh, let me say the two who are serving who are confirmed, Vic Mercado and, and Ken Raparano, are very capable public servants. Mm -hmm. I honor those who are in, who are, who are working to preserve our national security. But the, just as the Senate and the, and the Congress as a whole have an important role to play for our government, civilian officials in the Department of Defense have, have a fundamentally important role to play in overseeing the department and in setting policy. I have the greatest respect for Chairman Mark Milley, for Vice Chairman John Hyten, for the service chiefs, for the uh, for the combatant commanders and others. But you need uh, civilian officials in at senior levels and you want them to be Senate confirmed so that it's clear that they're able to speak for the president 
uh, and speak for the Secretary of Defense in what they and what they do. So I'm I am uh, uh, even even when there are policy differences, there have been in in various administrations. Having Senate confirmed officials is is fundamentally important. And I I uh, if should Trump win a second term, I hope that they'll do better in this regard. And frankly, I've, I've I have to conclude by saying, and I hope that both the administration and the Senate will do its due diligence and do its job in ensuring that officials who are nominated are qualified. I, I am frankly su surprised and appalled that Anthony Tata was nominated for Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. I don't believe I've ever met him. I've seen what he's had to say, mm -hmm. including on, on, you know, on Fox that uh, he's claimed that President Obama was aiding and abetting terrorism. Uh, and uh, and let me just say, you know, to conclude this, uh, kudos to people like General Joe Votel, General Tony Thomas, General Dave Deptula, who withdrew their support when they found out that this had occurred. Uh, and it's that kind of principal leadership that we should expect of all of our leaders, military and civilian. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's get to the policy issues. Um, and let me take you back to January of 2012. Um, President Obama had unveiled his defense uh, strategic review, which I'm confident you had a, a hand in. Uh, and the reason why I bring it up, because this review, um, many of our uh, Arab partners uh, suspected that it was a document that sort of started shifting America's attention from the Middle East to Asia. They might be right, they might be wrong. Uh, first, just remind us, what were the main pillars of that document um, and did it, effectively message to the world our intent to pivot uh, to Asia. And do you remember if um, how the review was received, at least, by our more important uh, Arab partners uh, in the Middle East? Yes. Yeah, so well, I have a slightly different interpretation, and it may well be that I was involved right. uh, in the defense strategic guidance uh, you know, development you. And, and issuance. Uh, yeah, but my recollection is that the Middle East was still a high priority. Uh, you know, mm. This was released in January of 2012, the Defense Strategic Guidance, and I and I certainly can tell you that as in my time as Undersecretary, I spent a lot spent a lot of time both on and in the Middle East. Right. Uh, and uh, you're going to have to check me on this now, uh, but my recollection is that the front of the document has a letter from the President and then a letter from the Secretary of Defense and that both highlight the importance of the Middle East along with the Asia Pacific. It was, I, I recall Europeans being concerned that we hadn't highlighted Europe as much. This was 2012, you know, uh, more than two years before Putin would send little green men into Ukraine. Right. Uh, but Asia Pacific and Middle East were both highlighted and we retained a significant force posture in the Middle East during that period and, and during my time in government. Mm -hmm. uh, what it was, and this may be what people keyed off of, it was a decisive shift away from uh, having a military pre prepared to do counterinsurgency operations that involved hundreds of thousand or more boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think some did interpret this uh, as a shift away from the Middle East. I want to say, though, uh, we listed, I think it was nine missions at, at, at some I haven't, I haven't gone back <laughs> to look at it for a while, but nine or 10 missions, counterterrorism was listed at the top of that list mm -hmm. uh, and it outlined an approach that focused on building partner security and right. on counterterrorism uh, through direct action when needed. So in, in my view, this was an, if anything, an overdue shift in our approach vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and Afghanistan and others. I do think there are other events that did shape perceptions of the U.S. commitment to the Middle East. And if you'd like, I can, you know, list, list uh, several of those. Shoot. Sure. Okay, so um, one you mentioned, Bilal, and that was uh, in, not just in 2012, but starting in 2009, th yeah. there was a recognition that China was rising. Right. And uh, as we look to rebalance the overall allocation of not just military assets, but efforts of diplomacy and so on, to focus more on Asia Pacific, Unfortunately, the administration called it the pivot. Yeah. And our friends, our friends and, and allies in the Middle East and Europe said, think about that. Uh, when you pivot, you are turning towards something, but you're also turning away from others. 
That's true. And so that was that was something that uh, as we rebalanced, uh, that was an issue. Second, of course, uh, around the same time as or just after the defense strategic guidance, in, in uh, now the Arab Spring, as you know well, was was underway, and yeah. in spring June, I think of June 2012. Uh, Morsi was elected president mm -hmm. of Egypt, and this came as a surprise and, and to many and a shock to some. Uh, I remember that we had uh, deputies meeting that day, and, and, and it was a very close election. And the Obama administration decided, and rightly in my view, that it was a that it was a fair election, and that the United States should attempt to help Egypt succeed on this on its path. Um, a lot of Saudi, Emirati, uh, for that matter, Israeli and others viewed Morsi as a puppet of the Muslim Brotherhood, of which, which he had a strong affiliation, and were surprised to see us come in on and to support this action. I, my view was it was the right choice, not because it was Morsi, but because it was a fair election. Mm -hmm. the, the third, and maybe, I don't know if you're going to ask about this later, but the third big thing came a little bit later in August 2013 when President Obama initially decided to conduct strikes uh, yeah. uh, af after Bashar al-Assad used uh, chemical weapons multiple times without any doubt on his own population. Yep. President Obama decided to conduct strikes, then decided to put it to a vote, and then decided ultimately to, to follow a different path. Sure. And a number of us had reached out to our Middle East uh, uh, allies and partners uh, and had called to say, we're, we're, we'll be conducting strikes. We'd like your support. And we'd not just rhetorically, but we'd like your aircraft engaged in the strikes also. Uh, do you, and, and so uh, having those conversations with senior leaders uh, of, of several Middle East countries and then calling them back the next day to say, well, we're taking a different path, uh, I think I think was uh, was challenging and, uh, 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 and and shocked to many. And uh, perhaps obviously I supported strikes. I did my best to support the policy that followed when we didn't conduct strikes. Yeah. But uh, I, I do think that was a shock to many. Uh, yeah. And many who had been asking the United States to take a, a leadership role, uh, a di you know, do a different sport metaphor that they use, they'd say, at least be the quarterback. If right. you don't have to put all the players on the field, but at least be the quarterback. Right. Uh, and fourth, of course, JC, the negotiation of the of the Iran nuclear deal, the JC POA. Hold on because we're going to get okay. to that. Yeah, okay, that's a big item. Right. Yeah. So that was uh, underway at that time, and and yeah. people were sniff knew about it. It was right. very close. The negotiations were closely held. Yeah. And and the uh, and so that that was I think each of those, uh, and I supported the negotiations and the and the conclusion and the JCPOA. We could, well, but but I just want to note for this you know answer to this question, there's no doubt that that both our GCC partners and our uh, uh, and Israel uh, were not pleased with that, with that sure. either the negotiations or the outcome. Yeah, and the reason why I ask you about the defense strategic review, uh, uh, Jim, is because I myself I'm trying to understand better, like what is the intellectual or philosophical genesis of this great power competition concept that we now have, right? So maybe that's not it, and I think you provided a comprehensive answer because it was even before 2012, as you said yourself, 2009, the rise of China and all that. Um, but at the time, it seemed like that document sort of codified or formalized this interest of ours to shift a little bit more or devote greater attention and resources to other priority regions. Um, but I think you provided a comprehensive answer. Okay, you're just, right. You're right. You're, on that point, you're right. It was there was a rebalancing. Uh, there was particular attention to rebalancing toward Asia Pacific. Yeah. Uh, there is a desire to keep a, a substantial and adequate posture in Europe, but this was still a time of, you know, over two years before Putin went into Ukraine uh, and before we had evidence of other nefarious Russian activity around the world, or at least sufficient evidence, I guess. And so um, uh, whenever, whenever you're drawing down a force posture, the, the region from which you're, uh, where you're reducing may see yeah. it as a, as a reduced, as a reduced sign of commitment. And yeah. I understand that. And, and, uh, and I understand why some people may have perceived that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so during your time as USDP, um, as you mentioned yourself, the United States was negotiating a very important uh, nuclear deal with the Iranians. Um, 
and in 2015, the JCPOA was was born. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that period. I mean, obviously, it's um, it's been discussed ad nauseum, and there's a ton of media coverage about it. But give us sort of like a more of an inside scoop. Uh, how involved were you? Uh, obviously, you were very much. Uh, and and how was it to negotiate with these guys? So, Bilal, I was not involved directly in the negotiations of the JCPOA. Deputy Secretary of State Burns, National Security Advisor to Biden, and you know, later policy planning, uh, J or prior policy planning, Jake Sullivan, mm -hmm. and Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman really led the effort. They were supported by a technical team to include uh, Department of Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz, a, who's a brilliant physicist, right. nuclear physicist. So I... Uh, I was briefed on the negotiations as the, serving as the deputy for the interagency process. Mm -hmm. Secretary Panetta and Secretary Hagel were, were cognizant. Uh, they were, the negotiations were extremely closely held. Uh, we were briefed on the basics uh, and the military's main contribution was not on the negotiations or the Department of Defense's contribution was not on the negotiations, right. but it was in our part of the, of the Obama administration's pressure campaign to, mm -hmm. to to put pressure on Iran to stop its nuclear program and to uh, and to agree to a deal, and so keeping a strong military posture, preparing for strikes against Iran's nuclear program if necessary, mm -hmm. deterring Iranian misbehavior uh, against tankers and so forth or, or coercion mm -hmm. in the region, including countering actions of its special forces of its Quds, you know, working with the intelligence community, uh, and then without getting into details of the JCPOA, because that wasn't my lane, talking to leaders in the region about, about US policy and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you, um, you are correct that we got an earful throughout the process. And, and, uh, and I know, even though I had departed, I know it's true afterwards mm -hmm. from leaders in the region about the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanna say again that I, that I uh, supported the negotiation I, I think it was a, a, a good deal for the United States and for, the, and for other countries. Uh, and if Vice President Biden becomes president, I hope that he will return to the JCPOA and uh, we can talk about this more, but I think uh, I, that, that to me that, that there are two main criticisms of the JCPOA. Yep. One was that it had a timeline. Yep. So you know, you know, 10 to 15 years, depending on the issue, that, Iranians could go back to enrichment and so on. Mm -hmm. The second was that it only addressed the nuclear aspect right. of the problem and didn't address others. Right. My view is that cabin the, the negotiation to the nuclear issue, mm -hmm. work to make it indefinite. This administration's pressure campaign has succeeded in putting real economic pain mm -hmm. on the Iranian regime. And mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I, I, I can guarantee I won't, <laughs> I won't be the uh, you know, I would never be the Middle East uh, lead negotiator on something like this. So I, I'm, not spe I'm not speaking in any way for Vice President Biden or the campaign or anything else. But uh, I, I hope that, that we would work with our, with our other allies and other, other members of the uh, on negotiations to, to extend those timelines, ideally extend them indefinitely. Yeah. Uh, your boss, President Obama, was... Uh, stay on the subject of concerns and complaints, uh, was accused by the Gulf Air Partners of being aloof towards them and having no patience for their complaints about, you know, Tehran's aggressive behavior in the region. Um, and he's made his views very clear and a number of, you know, opportunities with the media, including that interview with uh, The Atlantic uh, with Jeffrey Goldberg. Is there anything, having worked with him personally, is there anything that we misunderstood about the president? Uh, do you think those accusations were unfair or there was some legitimacy to them? I think there's two things, Bilal. One, one is how President Obama presents himself and how he, uh, um, he's, a, he's a kind, in my view and experience, he's a kind, warm person, but he's, he, he's a little bit, I, I use the term aloof. I wouldn't use that, but he's 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 he has such a calm demeanor. I think that it, that in in uh, in situations where people who 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 haven't experienced that, who don't recognize that, could mistake that for uh, 
uh, for disdain or for aloofness. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I mean, there are occasions, including one with uh, one where he described President Putin as a, I, I may get the quote a little wrong, but as like a, a, a fifth grader unhappy, you know, in the back of the classroom where, <laughs> where that criticism was justified. But I think there's a little bit of that uh, in that. Um, and, and the second is, uh, I, I do think President Obama had a different view than many of, of, of the experts in the national security community about where the United States should go and where we should focus as well. I do, having said that, I do think he was clear-eyed about Iran. I, I will say, I believe there were those in his administration who truly believed that if we had the JCPOA, then Iran would, Iran's leadership would suddenly change its approach to the world and it would reduce terrorism. It would be integrated. It would want to work more with the West. My view was you give these guys more money, they're going to use it. Uh, they'll use some of it for the economy and they'll use some of it uh, to turn the dial up on, on nefarious activity with the Quds Force and IRGC and so on. Yeah. And that we needed to prepare for that and, and make clear to them that, that there will be a heavy price to pay if they do so. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, those were the those were sort of the range of views, if you will, that when I was in the administration. And uh, I think I think I do think President Obama had a had a realist view. He didn't think Iran was suddenly going to change into to become an ally or a friend. Uh, he knew that that we had important interest and uh, important friends in the in the region. Um, uh, and in fact, I just say in 2009, when I was relatively, uh, you know, I had just started the Obama administration, was asked to go to the Middle East. I, I won't give you the details, but to, but because o President Obama wanted to close an important arms deal with one of the major players there, and I got an insight into his views mm -hmm. of those of the leaders and of the region at that time, and uh, I I believe he was clear-eyed, uh, and I believe that he knew that we had important interests and important relationships. Uh, uh, and uh, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll stop there. Tell me about Abcake and uh, Jures, uh, Jim. The um, attack of fall of 2019 suspected to be the work of Iran against uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, oil infrastructure. You know what those, those terms mean because you've served in government. Have we, or do you know, if we have actually conducted a strategic review of what the hell happened, uh, or we didn't really think that it was that significant of an event and that people are exaggerating that the Carter Doctrine is dead and uh, that you know it's business as usual, even though it's not, obviously. What's your own view of what happened? How significant was it? How much of a challenge has it posed to the perception in the region about our security commitment? So Bilal, as you know, this was, I think, September 2019. So That's I was right. well right. out of government. Uh, That's right. So I'm not going to fault you for that one. My <laughs> <laughs> in addition, I don't, I don't have any inside information. I, so I'm working off the same information base that you are. Right. Uh, but, the, but my information on that was that uh, uh, about a 50% reduction in Saudi oil production for a period, financial shock globally as a result. Although the Houthis claimed credit for it, I didn't find that credible that they act, certainly that they acted alone. And the US, Saudis, Germany, UK, and I think France uh, all said publicly Iran was responsible. Right. So, so I take, I don't know if you need a strategic review after that. I, I think, uh, I believe Iran was responsible. Uh, and so it's been reported that the U.S. conducted cyber attacks against Iran in response to this attack. In addition to the cyber attacks in June of, yeah, June of 2019, after Iran shot down a Global Hawk, an uh, RQ-4, a uh, U.S. drone. In my, so I, is, my view is that cyber is an incredibly important tool. It's, it should, it's one of the a key domain of our day-to-day -day gray zone competition as well as conflict. Mm -hmm. But in this case, and, and let me add, I should say, and, it, and cyber can be a military tool. If you're taking down integrated air defense systems, if you're, if you're frying computers, these can be uh, use of force. In some cases, could even be considered an act of war through cyberspace. 
So it's not, but in this case, cyber was inadequate. In yep. this case, this was a physical strike against first the, the Global Hawk in June, and then a US partner in the region. And in my view- Not to mention the various acts of aggression at sea, right? Yes, indeed. Hmm. Yeah, and multiple acts uh, uh, of aggression that, uh, that went beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. Now, now I, so I think on those acts of aggression against tankers, uh, the use of physical force, the, the downing of a, of a drone, and to pile on uh, physical attacks on the critical infrastructure of a, of a key partner in the region, uh, cyber is not enough. The world needs to see that a great power such as the United States does not let a middle power, if you will, even a strong regional power, take action like this against its assets, its allies and partners. Mm -hmm. and so I believe we should have conducted military strikes. And yes, there would have been a risk of escalation. But in my view, there's a greater risk of Iranian escalation if you don't hit back in a way that they understand. Um, I wasn't in government, so I can't say whether this government uh, was, uh, I've read reports that they were prepared to conduct strikes and that President Trump pulled back at the last minute. Uh, I believe uh, this administration or any administration should have been able to get the support of the GCC, of our NATO allies and of many others for the conduct of such strikes and that that would be a reasonable proportionate response. It doesn't mean exactly tit for tat, when I hit them, I'm uh, talking to be clear. I'm not talking about bombing Tehran. I'm talking about strikes. Maybe targets on, in Syria. Uh, it could be targets in Syria. It could be in Iran. It does not have to be symmetrical, but right. it sh we should have destroyed some of their military as a result of this and made it clear that that uh, that is the price that would be paid. Okay. What's your honest view of the maximum pressure campaign? Well. I think you've already started alluding that there's some benefit to it, right? But just tell yeah. us a little bit more. So, um, to be, you know, to be honest uh, with myself, uh, and I, I've said I've already I supported the JCPOA. I thought it was a mistake to with, withdraw, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the I think that this administration has uh, has been able to in a sense, have a free ride as the Europeans kept the Iranians more or less in the agreement. Now they've, be, you know, they've begun to spend some more centrifuges again, but kept them more or less in line, even as we put ex much greater economic pressure on Iran. Yep. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the positive thing, thing to say about the maximum pressure campaign is that it really has put significant pressure uh, on the Iranian economy and, in my view, on their leadership. Now, the question is, can this administration or is this administration willing to translate that into a realistic deal sure. that, would, that would constrain the Iranian nuclear program right. or are they attempting to squeeze indefinitely and attempt to cause regime change? I, I don't believe regime change will happen because of this. Mm -hmm. I do believe that it's possible that because of this very effective, very punishing, uh, uh, set of sanctions on Iran, that there's a greater likelihood that Iran would agree to uh, not just an extension of the JCPOA, but an ex but a, 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 an expansion in time. And as I said, I would I would start by aiming for indefinite limits so that Iran will never enrich, Iran will never pursue any nuclear weapons related activities. Uh, and if we're going to do that, uh, not just as the United States, but you know with the with the P5 plus one as we have before, we are gonna to have to probably add additional carrots as well, even as we release it. I think that's, that's a good deal. And as we do it, let's not make what in my view is the error of last time. Let's yeah. recognize that as they get additional resources, mm -hmm. the Iranians, this, the, this regime is gonna act like it has in the past and it, like it has historically. And it's probably, it's gonna use some of those resources with, for the Quds Force and IRGC and to and, and the IRGCN and to do to uh, whether through cyberspace through maritime operations through support of the Houthis and we need to be strong and we need to have strong partnerships to push back uh, to prevent acts when we when we can to sig to signal clearly that it's unacceptable 
And then when they take those actions to punish them in ways that both have international support and have real consequences for the regime. That's an interesting point you make um, about the carrots. So what do you have in mind that certainly wouldn't, wouldn't also shoot us in the foot? I mean, you mentioned the resources. I, was there anything else that you had in mind? Well, I've, I, I have not uh, developed anything approaching a plan, but I think that the, uh, the principle that we should follow, and I, I credit former Vice Chairman Sandy Winnefeld for articulating this concept so clearly when we were involved in this process. Yep. Uh, it should be uh, reversible uh, actions uh -huh. on our part for anything that's reversible on the Iranians' part. Yep. And for things that are hard to, you know, to ratchet back, mm -hmm. uh, to turn back around, it needs to be irreversible on, irreversible on their part also. Okay. And so uh, uh, let me be clear about something. I'm not talking about telling them, okay, uh, we're pulling out of Iraq. Uh, no, I know that. Okay, yeah. okay the, region, the region's yours. Uh, we made a huge error in the, in, in, in the Iraq war in multiple ways, uh -huh. but uh, it, it's fundamental to understand that one of the things that it did is empower Iran and that, uh, and that c pulling out entirely and giving them carte blanche would be a, would be a, a strategic error of the, of the first order. The reason why I emphasize this, Jim, is because you know we've tried both ways, right? We've tried the carrots and sticks with um, the JCPOA, and now we're going purely punitive, right? There is no carrot whatsoever, and neither has worked. And and then you just wonder, right, what's left? Uh, and a lot of smart people have argued for regime change, not actually going and occupying the country, obviously, but just trying to do pursue measures that could lead from within to a change of government, right? Supporting, and we've done it throughout the Cold War. So um, that's why I mentioned the issue of carrots because it's really difficult to crack, especially when there's such significant ideological disagreements, uh, divergences uh, and worldviews, right? Uh, but let's just leave it at that. Um, you know, I, could, I, I guess I could add, let me say, if we, if regime change in Iran is going to occur and is going to result in something that's desirable for us, it will come from uh, from within. Sure, yeah. And uh, and the 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 U.S. making the case uh, uh, that the regime is irresponsible, not taking care of its people, should uh, in in the case where right uh, sorry, right now the Iranian leadership can say sanctions are why we're unable to provide for the people. It's mm -hmm. it's these it's these it's this American sanctions. If there were a deal in which sanctions were loosened, the United States should keep do everything it can to keep the Iranian government on the hook to allocate its resources to improve the lives of its people uh, and to act responsibly uh, uh, within the region as well. So I, I'll I'll stop there. But it, but yeah. I, uh, in general. It's not a good strategy to you know to hit people with carrots or try to feed them sticks. Oh, you do want well to, received. you know. <laughs> well received. Um, tell me about Saudi Arabia. This is a question that I asked uh, Michelle Flournoy, and uh, and I realize that there is no silver bullet here, but this is one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, partner that we have in the Arab world, and we seem to be having some challenges in that relationship uh, for various reasons, and we don't we don't need to get into those. Um, and they're not new. Um, some strategic, some domestic, some what they're doing and some what we're doing, but just with a more of a future perspective, how do you think we should manage that critical relationship? And, and I realize that there's a few months for this administration, unless it's a few months and four more years, but let's just assume that there's a change administration. I mean, what, what new menu, what new metrics should we be using to move this thing to a better place. You know, let me first say how much I agree with your assertion that the U.S.-Saudi relationship is of fundamental importance to regional stability and also to the global economy. Even as the U.S. Is, has increased its oil output so dramatically through the use of fracking and you know and so forth, Saudi Arabia still accounts. You correct me on this, like for 12% of global oil production today, and it's projected to rise to 15%. By 2025, and so uh, that is, and if you look at the long-term energy projections, um, uh, even 
even even if you get renewable energy to grow dramatically by two and a half times to by 2050, you still need oil. You still need oil. You still need natural gas. Uh, and in fact, you need more than you have today. Uh, and so, and so, I know that the Saudis are working to diversify their economy, and and uh, you know, uh, and so, don't want to. But but the their role in the overall global economy is of fundamental importance. Sure. And there's a historic, you know, as you know well, historic relationship that uh, that is real between the U.S. and the Saudis. Yep. So, the the first and most important principle of U.S. Saudi relations, from my perspective is realism on both sides. Wow. And so I, I feel like today we've got a, a, an administration that in uh, that I don't know if it's because it has business interests. I, I don't know for what reason, but I don't, I don't know that it's conducting diplomacy with the Saudis in a way that another Republican administration would. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have a Congress uh, that since the uh, murder of, Jamal Khashoggi almost so two years ago this October uh, has has not has uh, has not just wanted to impose costs but not wanted to have to find a path back to a normal relationship mm -hmm. uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and so we need to be realistic uh, uh, and not not just cognizant of history but cognizant of the future that the US Saudi relationship is fundamentally important to regional stability vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and more broadly. It's fundamental to the world economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 even though the US has increased its oil output, it's fundamental to the world economy. And that it is, and that the role of the kingdom uh, in Islam, in addition, makes it fundamentally important as uh, 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 to, a, to a substantial fraction of the, not just the regional population, but global population. So, so, uh, incredibly important stakes that cut, or, cut across national security, economy, religion, and so forth. And we need a realistic approach, and we need to, we need to have a working relationship with the Saudi uh, with the Saudi government uh, for our own interests, for regional interests, and for global interests, as uh, as as well as for the for the Saudis. Michelle mentioned Michelle Florian mentioned an honest to God conversation with these guys. Very transparent, zero in on. Uh, common goals and common interests, obviously, which is eminently sensible. Um, I'm just trying to push you, just like I try to push her, for something that would really recognize the major new trends and that would um, perhaps call for new measures that would amplify the realism that you just mentioned. Uh, this is not business as usual anymore. I mean, there's a bipartisan consensus that there's a crisis in the relationship. So yes, call for realism, but is there anything else that could, you know, uh, gravitate this to a more stable uh, trajectory? Uh, uh, because right now, I mean, if you keep things as they are, I think we're headed to, I don't want to say divorce, because it's We've been in a Catholic marriage with the Saudis for a while, but it's, it's, it's a, perhaps you know a, a, a rupture in relations uh, and and them hedging their bets and getting closer to the Chinese and the Russians and we're going to get concerned about that because of the great power competition. We don't want that to happen. So I don't want to put you on the spot, obviously, but it's I, I just feel like this is a moment that calls for new tools, perhaps a new philosophy and a new approach is that exaggerated or just let's just go back to what we did before because we're pretty good at it until the administration came and screwed up everything <laughs> no there were there were frictions between the obama administration and the saudis as right. you know as you know well so um and it's uh, to me i mean th let me say there have been in my experience friction between every one of our allies and partners in the united states over issues and what I, where I resonate with Michelle on this point is that true allies and partners work together. They, 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 they are frank with each other in, and they do it in private. And they work to build strong relationships that are resilient uh, across a wide range of issues. So if your question is, are there specific initiatives, uh, for example, on the economic front, as the Saudis work to diversify their economies where we might turn up the dial, uh, uh, I think that's a possibility. I, 
it's it's not you it's not my I'm a national security guy and so I've not looked in detail at where all the deals that uh, 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 MBS had been working you know, with American companies and others stand well, but let I think me, let me lob you this but, but I think like, it's you know, diversification is, uh... of their economy is 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 a, is, a, is a helpful thing uh, uh, and there's a wide range of uh, you know on the economic front and on uh, the education of their po of their populace is is both in their interest and in, in global interest, and if there are innovative approaches that we have there. So, I've not given it deep thought, but I'm. I, let me say, I invite you and anyone listening and watching that has great thoughts to, to say I, I I'm interested to hear them because I think it's an extremely important relationship for the United States and for regional and global security. Let me just end this the final point, uh, and I think you'll react positively to it. Do you think there's benefit, and it's about time, long overdue, that this relationship needs proper institutionalization, right? Uh, working with these guys on multiple levels, you know, working level, junior level, and senior levels, not just at heads of state level. Do you think that this will benefit the relationship to have greater coordination on multiple issues? Yes. Okay. So, and and yes. Bilal, I, 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 <laughs> I engaged in bilats, uh, you know, for the Defense Department with the Saudis, and uh, and there was a degree of that. Uh, I don't know where it stands, where that aspect stands now, yeah. but I, uh, if it if it is where it was when I left, then uh, there there's a there's a value to more depth and more breadth. Right. Uh, exactly, it could be two plus two, you know, state and defense. It could, and so, yeah. And, yeah. but to have a range of issues. Yeah, uh, and we shouldn't see the relationship as solely or even predominantly military. Although that's, uh, of course, an incredibly important aspect of it. Right. The reason why I tell you this because, as you very well know, I look at South Korea, I look at Japan. Sure enough, they're treaty allies, so that's different, right? So we look at these countries differently. But but the level of integration on multiple levels is astounding. It's remarkable. And yes, it's a very high ceiling uh, if you are going to apply that to any Arab partner. But I mean, heck, this is a good model. Just look to that and see if you can achieve even 20% of that. That would be far better than what we have currently. But let's just leave it at that. Um, okay, Iraq. Um, in uh, June of 2014, fall of Mosul, um, and it happened after you left office, so I'm not gonna blame you for that. Um, um, Thanks so much, Bilal, I appreciate and... <laughs> that. <laughs> Why didn't the president at the time um, take ISIS seriously. Forget about the comments that he mentioned. I'm not sure he even meant them. But what kind of intelligence did we have at the time regarding the organization? Because clearly it wasn't good intelligence for him to come up with such comments. So did we just not know enough? And, um, and then obviously, ultimately, we knew much better. Tell us um, what was the thinking at the time and what might have prompted the president to describe them to the JV team. Okay, so um, I'm, I wasn't there. And so I'm, I'm not making excuses, but I'm saying because I wasn't there, I, uh, the good news is I there's no risk of my divulging what intelligence was present at that time because I don't know. Right. But I, I can tell you when I left government in January of 2014, I had no inkling that there was something called ISIS or ISIL, Islamic State. Uh, I had no I had no sense that you know Baghdadi would emerge as uh, as he did, uh, and um, and so let me say first, this was an intelligence failure of the first order. It ranks up there. It it ranks up there in the same family with Pearl Harbor, with 9/11. It was a major intelligence failure, and I've not seen a good review of why it occurred. It's a shared yeah. intelligence very obviously with our partners too. It's it it is. Yeah. It is. And I I don't know I I honestly don't know precisely why it happened, but mm -hmm. I believe if you don't even know there is such an organization and it yeah. pops up. Yeah. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, frankly, I I know for a fact that President Obama was an avid consumer of intelligence. We've been discussions about the PDD, the President's Daily Brief, recently. You mean, and, you know, you mean was, he read it? I mean he. I, I mean he read it. He asked hard questions, and the way the PDB works is that when one person asks a question that's answered overnight, typically by the intelligence community, 
others who received the PDB, which I did as undersecretary, see it. Right. And I can just tell you that, and although they don't identify who asked the question, you can figure out uh, um, by context and by style sometimes. Mm -hmm. Obama was an avid consumer of intelligence. And so he was misinformed. And I believe he was misinformed because the intelligence community was misinformed. And I don't, I, uh, and you're right, it's, it was a, a, not just a failure of our intelligence community, but of, uh, uh, but of, uh, of, our, of our partners, mm -hmm. multiple partners as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I honestly, I, well, I think that's about, about all I can say about it. Yep. Uh, and it's obvious, it's obvious that this was an intel failure uh, I think Obama, you know, misperceived it because of that. Uh, a broader lesson uh, for policymakers, uh, it includes the questions in the PDB, is 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 to is to continue to ask for uh, alternative views and red teaming and ask the what if questions. Sure. Yeah. Are, yeah. are we sure? You know, are, you know, are we are we sh are we sure that the Islamic State has no I mean, uh, that uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq has has no residuals that you know that there's nothing that there's nothing going on here how do we know that right. uh given all the things going on for uh, for the united states as a great power that's that's tough to to, to ask that type of question yeah. uh but certainly within the ic the intelligence community they need to do so we got four minutes uh, and two final questions so um and i understand from my colleagues we have a hard stop at 11. um should we leave iraq that simple as long as the Iraqi government and people support the United States being there, in my view, we should we should stay, and uh, and that we should stay to to help uh, train and support their troops. We should stay because it's in our interest to do so, uh, because it helps us get uh, better eyes on the potential threat from a resurgence of ISIS, you know, in, inside an intelligence. Because frankly, it helps us for to keep Iran from further expanding its influence in Iraq to some degree. Uh, and again, frankly, it helps us to be able to be in a position to engage in the, their internal politics, Iraq's internal politics, and help at least at least nudge things uh, toward uh, 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 internal stability and appropriate treatment of, of all populations within Iraq. So uh, it's uh, if the Iraqi government and people don't want us, we need to leave. Uh, if uh, if we can be helpful with the small presence there, and that presence can be well defended, mm -hmm. it needs to be it needs to be big enough to be well defended. Then I believe it, it's valuable for us to have a posture there uh, and to and to treat Iraq as a as an important partner. Sounds fair to me. Um, I can't end the conversation without um, referring to the great power competition. So just a quick um, uh, question about China and uh, Russia. Is there an opportunity for sort of a shared approach between us and the Gulf partners regarding these two uh, adversaries or are the differences between us and our partners regarding how to deal with these two too great for really to have a shared approach? Oh, that's a, a good question. Uh, I think there are areas where there'll be a shared approach because there is a shared global approach that we want to bring our partners into. So yep. uh, climate change, uh -huh. um, um, non-proliferation, including with respect to Iran and so forth. Right. Um, but I, but I'll, you know, frankly, the if you're the uh, uh, Saudi leadership or Emirati leadership or et cetera, you've got to think about what's in the interest of your country and they're going to need to trade with China. It makes sense for them to it be, you know, Chinese, not just oil, but in, uh, in other areas as well. Mm -hmm. And the United States needs to understand that and accept that. And, uh, uh, and so having a common approach uh, across the board doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, I think an area where we should have a common approach uh, certainly is, is, is with respect to China's Belt and Road Initiative, their digital Silk Road, their and, and so forth, where they are attempting to make inroads in countries, uh, attempting to export tools of authoritarian control, uh, facial recognition and social scores and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we should discourage our partners from, from engaging in that, where they're attempting to put in networks that allow them to both spy on our, our partners and us and to uh, turn off the uh, IT support if necessary, if they desire to. 
So I think on some issues, uh, we should have a common approach, but particularly with respect to China, we need to understand that it's a, it, it is a global major power, it's here to stay. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and finally, we, there are rules of the road, whether cyberspace, outer space, maritime, all domains, there are rules of the road for economic behavior. And we should ask our, our allies and partners adhere, we adhere, and we should ask their support in ensuring that China and Russia adhere. Uh, and finally, on the, in the information space, yeah. uh, we, should ask, we should ask for their support. We need to get our own act together more, but we should also ask for their support uh, uh, with respect to pushing back on disinformation, misinformation, uh, uh, and the types of actions that Russia and has taken, for example, in our 2016 election, and that China appears increasingly to be taking globally. Jim, uh, running out of time, uh, I want to thank you uh, very, very much uh, for your time today. Uh, I know you're very busy, um, and you're most welcome to come back whenever you want. Uh, but let me give you the opportunity to offer any final remarks. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, to see you. I look forward to the opportunity to do so face to face again. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for not just for the conversation, but for what you're doing. Uh, the Middle East remains fundamentally important to U.S. interests. As we've talked about, the relationships are critically important and we need to be realistic. But, uh, and, and by that, I mean, we need to understand that they are important and that this region and its, and its players uh, will have a, a big role in the, not just the regional order, but the global world order uh, and where we go in the future. So thank you and it's been a pleasure. Wise words. Thank you, Jim. You take care of yourself. Do the same, Allah. Take care. Bye-bye. Right.